word to wise Grass only greener when it's fertilized Gave them truth in these songs, they prefer the lies That's any beautiful adrift than her purple lies You can't see me, you see me Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Evie And make it look easy what is up, Earth's mightiest subscribers? It's Ernie, Blurred Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, we are going to be talking about Hellions number 14 by Zeb Wells and Roger Antonio. And in today's video, what we're going to be talking about is exactly how the Chimeras from House of X and Powers of Ten are potentially returning in the X-Men's timeline, and more importantly, why they are appearing in the X-Men's timeline sooner rather than later as they did in Mora X's previous line. Lives. We're going to be talking about all this and more right now, but first, if you want to see more awesome videos like this one, make sure you hit that subscribe button, and if you enjoy the video, I humbly ask that you Hulk smash that like button because it really helps the channel out. That said, let's talk about Hellions number 14. All right, so in this issue, a lot of really interesting things come up. We learn a lot more about what's going on with Tarn, the uncaring, why him showing up on Krakoa, more specifically on Bar Sinister, why it's kind of a big deal, not so much just in the fact that he's a, a minthy mutant, that he is this incredibly powerful mutant who is, for all intents and purposes, probably one of the more powerful beings that we have bared witness to since Ten of swords and more importantly we're learning that not all of the Iraqi mutants actually agree with what he wants to do the whole idea of him coming to Krakoa to exact justice against Mr. Sinister for having stolen the DNA of the mutants from a myth more specifically his locust vial this is a great crime against him as he feels but I was actually really surprised to you know read this issue and learn that when Storm who by the way still wearing her hellfire gala out Outfit. And I'm, I'm here for it because it's like Storm literally found this amazing costume and is like, I'm never taking this off. It's awesome. That said, I did find it very interesting that not only did uh, Storm take umbrage with him wanting to exact revenge on Mr. Sinister, but I also thought it was more interesting in the sense that Iska, the unbeaten, and Idil, the future seer, as well as various other mutants who we've kind of gotten to know a little bit since Planet Side. X-Men number one, where it's interesting that they are all saying, for the most part, the same thing, that you can't go. And of course, by this particular point early in the comic where we see what is called a blade fish from Mother Rapture, which is one of the locust vial, we see this thing appear through a portal and then Tarn is like, well, off to Krakoa I go. It's not till later in the book that we see him actually arrive. And the reason why Tarn the Uncaring is so adamant about this is because they stole the the DNA that was his. It was his to collect. It was his to have. He feels as though Mr. Sinister has, for all intents and purposes, stolen fire from the gods and it's in this that he has come to reclaim what it is that was stolen from him and it is something that is very potentially dangerous for Mr. Sinister to have if Tarn the Uncaring has this in his possession and Mr. Sinister has it if Tarn is worried about Mr. Sinister having it then it should be thought of as a big deal now when I say that Tarn is worried about Sinister having this I'm not saying that it's for altruistic reasons he doesn't want to save or spare the world of Mr. Sinister having a minty mutant DNA that's not what this is about. It's just the principle of the matter. But the fact that Mr. Sinister has access to this is something that is a really huge deal because somewhere towards the end of this book, not only do we realize that Tarn is capable of snatching the essence of the DNA, the thing that made Nanny, Wild Child, and Orphan Maker much more predatory and more aggressive mutants after they died in a myth during Ten of Swords, Tarn is able to snatch that out of them. He actually removes it from Wild Child, turning him back into more of the Wild Child that we knew before Ten of Swords. And presumably, we haven't necessarily seen him do this to Orphan Maker or Nanny just yet, but presumably he's going to do the same to them as well. 
Tarn is going to reveal the truth behind Sinister's treachery to the Hellions as well, because this is meant more as a dividing tactic to pretty much stack the entire deck against Sinister, revealing to the Hellions what Sinister actually did to them when they transported the Amenthi DNA back across the Krakoan Gate. And of course, it gets about the reaction that you would expect. And of course, Sinister in kind, he is going to unleash all his clones so that he can create a diversion while he exits through his no gate. Now, no gates are something that we haven't necessarily talked about in quite some time. A no gate is, for all intents and purposes, it's kind of similar to a no place. This is something that we first talked about in House of X. It's no different from your normal Krakoan gates. The only difference is this is a gate that only Mr. Sinister can use. It's a gate that only anyone with his DNA can cross through and probably not unlike Moore's no place, exactly where it takes you is probably a place that is within Krakoa, most likely, that Krakoa doesn't know about. That's how Mora's no place, at the very least, worked. It was a place that kind of existed outside of the collective consciousness of Krakoa itself, so technically, even if it is within Krakoa, Krakoa doesn't know about it, or at least isn't aware of its existence, or at the very least, if it is aware of its existence, it has no clue what actually goes on there, or can you know see or look into anything that goes on there, and that's probably more closer to the case, especially in regards to what Mr. Sinister is doing in this issue, because he reveals to clone Sinister, our Sinister who returned from Ten of Swords after being ripped apart by Tarn the Uncaring, Mr. Sinister just says, one word to clone Sinister that makes him completely reevaluate whether or not he wants to follow along with Mr. Sinister Proper's plan. And it's the word Chimera. This is a word that we saw come up quite a bit in the Powers of Ten sector of House of X. These were mutants that Mr. Sinister had created through a breeding program. This is all stuff that theoretically occurred in Moore's Ninth Life, something that we bared witness to in Powers of Ten, numbers one through three. This is when we were introduced to characters like Rasputin, Cardinal, Percival, and Silabel in the time period roughly around when Apocalypse and Wolverine and the Chimeras had infiltrated the Church of Ascendancy and stolen the hidden Nimrod files that gave them the information they needed to affect the next life. More specifically, the life that we are presumably in right Right now, which is Life 10, as far as Mora X is concerned. Now, of course, we already know that the colonization of Mars is not something that's unique to Mora's 10th life, because we did get information during House of X that they had already colonized Mars in the previous life, so they just kind of carried over that same blueprint, but did it a lot sooner in this life versus the previous one, and this is where they kept the Sinister Breeding Pits, the place where Mr. Sinister, for all intents and purposes, executed a program that was very similar to the Sentinel Hound program, but instead of using very various mutants abilities and putting them together to create the perfect mutant spy, they actually use this to create more aggressive and militaristic mutants. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because of a myth. Because, of course, going back to it, mutants who died in Araco, they came back more aggressive. And we also know that mutants in a myth, they are more aggressive and more predatory in nature. And Tarn the Uncaring just proved that this is something that can technically be removed. It's basically a genetic trait that can be added or taken away. And of course, we know that with the Chimeras, one in particular being Rasputin, Rasputin was a mutant that had five different DNA signatures from five completely different mutants baked into her. Specifically, the DNA of Quinn Quire, aka Kid Omega. She had his telepathic capabilities. She also possessed the metamorphic capabilities of the mutant Colossus. She possessed the intangibility and phasing abilities of one Kate Pride. She also possessed the healing factor of Lara Kinney, a.k.a. Wolverine. And she also possessed the force field capabilities of Gunther Bane, a.k.a. Eunice the Untouchable. This was a huge deal because the Chimeras went through roughly four generations of genetic evolution, whereas the original Chimeras were considered fodder from inside the breeding pits and that they were soldiers trained in the Martian underground until they reached age 16, at which time they traveled to Krakow to defend the mutant nation state, and then he goes on to talk about how it fell 30 some odd years later. When we get to the second and 
third generations of sinister mutants. This is when the term Chimera came into play. So basically, the whole Chimera term is coming in a lot earlier, or at the very least, maybe Sinister's already made that first generation. He's skipped some processes, but whatever the case is, the term Chimera is popping up a lot sooner rather than later. The second generation of Chimeras, that generation produced mutants that had DNA composed of two completely separate X genes, which basically gave you a more streamlined power set from both of the mutants that those X genes came from. Whereas the third generation Chimeras had upwards of five X genes. And these were probably some of the more, or at least the very first, successful chimeras that were produced up to that point, which is where Rasputin came into play. And then there was the fourth generation. The fourth generation is where things got a little bit more interesting because this is where there was tampering going on with these mutants. And, and they all tended to have omega level X gene based DNA. And there was a hive mind that was placed within these chimeras that was, for all intents and purposes, defective. That particular generation had a significantly higher fail rate versus, say, generations one, two, and three. And while most of the generation four chimeras committed suicide, there were still, of course, some outliers. But what we're getting at here is that this is where the chimeras are coming from in Mora's 10th life. It's not to necessarily say that Sinister probably didn't steal this DNA anyway, you know, based on events that probably occurred in that ninth life. However, in this particular instance, this DNA was stolen goods. He took the DNA of the locust vial, and that is where our chimeras are going to come from. Now, how is this going to play out? How exactly are these uh, chimeras that we're going to bear witness to in Hellions number 15? How you know, different are they going to be from the locust vial? How similar are they going to be to the uh, chimeras we saw in Powers of 10? It's very difficult to say, but I wouldn't expect them to be anything you know incredibly extraordinary compared to what we've seen in Powers of 10. But this is where all of this is coming from. So now you have a little bit more understanding as to how Mr. Sinister has managed to bring chimeras from one of Mora's previous lives to her current one. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, Hulk smash that like button and make sure to share this video all over the internet and with all your friends so they'll know how you leveled up your comic book big brain in regards to Hellions and Reign of X. On your way out, make sure to hit that subscribe button and let me know what you thought about Hellions number 14. Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.